Afternoon everyone, my name is Emma Shaw, I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Library of Things. We're a social enterprise, we've been going for three years, based in London. Uh, it took us the first two years just to find a space, so we've been operational in one site for uh, nine months now, um, opening up three more later this year. So I'm excited to share this with you as, I guess, a circular economy business model, which in theory can be plugged into any space in any community, be that a garage that you don't use, or the town hall, or the local library, or a corner shop, um, a huge warehouse, whatever scale you want it to work out. So, firstly, what is a library of things? It's, could, sorry, it's a little bit small up there. Um, it's a friendly place where people come to borrow useful things and learn how to use them. Our big mission is to make borrowing better than buying, and by better we mean more affordable, more convenient, and more socially rewarding. This is what it looks like. Um, you might not be able to tell that that is a shipping container. So we currently operate out of two old shipping containers. They went around the world quite a few times before they got to us. We've refurbished one into a essentially a retail space, um, with a kind of a retail experience. It doesn't feel like a junk shop. And next door, because we couldn't afford to do it yet, we've got a storage area for all of the things that don't fit in the retail space. And we use a warehouse, a kind of empty warehouse, to run classes and events and workshops and training. So it started off with three friends. Uh, you can see us there. And um, 500 pounds, 500 euros, which we managed to convince a local um, kind of community enterprise incubator to give us. And um, they also put us in touch with the local library that had a big space being used very infrequently for most of the week. So we started off not in the containers, but shoestring budget um, once a week in the local library to just run the, you know, a very lean pilot. Um, we, we thought it was an interesting idea ourselves. We had no idea whether people would use it whether it was vaguely interesting. Um, we didn't know what types of things people would want to borrow, um, whether they'd pay for that. So off the back of that pilot, which lasts 10 weeks, which signed up 100 members, ran on a free exchange basis um, with donated items. We then ran a crowdfunding campaign, which raised 15,000 pounds from 250 people um, to build the grandly <laughs> named flagship um, shipping container shop. <laughs> which um, is actually behind, it's on wasteland um, that is owned by the council, uh, behind a recycling centre, it's basically a dump. But since it opened last summer, it's now a big community garden, growing space, there's a cafe, there's a kitchen, um, it's, there's a living roof on top of the containers, it's, it's kind of unrecognisable. So, um, I'll come on to the, the actual, the things themselves, but, um, you can see that it's, it's filled with items like gardening, DIY tools, but also camping gear and things for adventures and projects. We think of ourselves as a community-powered business. Um, it's, it's run entirely off volunteer power right now. We're about to hire our first employee. And the way it works is that people can browse all of the items um, either in, in the space or online, on an online catalogue. They can become a member this is about to change. You can sign up for free. Anyone can sign up um, and, and use a pay-as-you-go borrow basis. So five pounds for a drill for a week, ten pounds for a gazebo for a week, you know, fifty p for a screwdriver. Um, that's turning into a monthly subscription for the most regular borrowers. But pay-as-you-go is always an option. You borrow the items. You uh, create something at home. You run a project. You go on an adventure. You can learn how to use anything that we have with our librarians who run the space, open three days a week, I should say. Um, we also host um, workshops like mending meetups that you can see here in this picture, woodworking, um, we've had batch cooking classes, um, and those are normally run by a local, um, a local expert who is probably a member of ours. So we seem very small right now, um, but we're very aligned with a movement towards this idea that we've talked about where all products become services within the next 13 years. I don't own anything, I don't own a car, I don't own a house, I don't own any appliances or any clothes. <laughs> That's the World Economic Forum. Um, and, you know, we're here talking about the circular economy, but 
Library of Things identifies more with a sharing economy. I don't think they're different. I think one, the sharing economy is kind of like the cool older sister of the circular economy. It's, it knows about the environmental reason, but it's about people and creating a very well-designed experience about accessing things that people can't always afford to access, be it a private driver, they use an Uber, be it your favorite meal couriered to you via delivery. It's the kind of just-in-time economy which is massively growing and so closely aligned with the circular economy. So I don't see them as distinct, just kind of ones maybe seen as cooler. Um, so there's a, an analysis you can see in the, in the bottom left there about the growth of that um, sharing economy in the UK. And right now, the leaders are Uber, peer-to-peer um, -peer transportation, Airbnb, the biggest hotel in the world, doesn't own a single building. Um, and that, that will change within the next 10 years, but um, where Library of Things positions itself is not necessarily peer-to-peer -peer yet. I think we see the world going that way, but if the sharing economy is enabled by the internet, it's a digital phenomenon, about a quarter of the UK population, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the, uh, the same stat for Ireland, is using that economy, there's 75% that aren't, and the people that aren't are not digitally connected, they're, they're over 65s, ethnic minorities, long-term unemployed, um, or, or, or receiving a state benefit. So Library of Things is very much positioned at the, at the, at the 75%, people who are otherwise excluded from the digital sharing economy, um, it's a physical intervention. Yes, we use digital, but ultimately it's like a local library and anyone can come in and anyone can join. So you might be wondering whether it's had any success. Um, like I said, it's been going for nine months. We've got 420 active borrowers, um, a, a, a waiting list of another 300 who haven't quite come in to use it yet, but they've said they've signed up. Um, about one in five of our members are regularly borrowing right now. And this is where we have room, to, room for improvement. Um, and a lot of that depends on the quality of the stock. 80% of our members are within a walk or bus ride away. So it's a hyper-local thing. Um, that map is about five miles top to bottom. So 80% are living within basically walking distance, within a very small radius. They are also the people that run the space. Um, and in terms of who these people are, they're not hipsters. There's a few hipsters. There's, there's, <laughs> there's a, a significant amount. 35% of our members are from low-income households. Um, that's not a coincidence because we're located right next to a surplus food supermarket, which is essentially a great version of a food bank, which takes food waste from big supermarkets and sells it at 80% of retail price to people from low-income um, households living nearby. So. Over a third of our members are, are the same members as those. Um, we also have about 40% of young families and young professionals, space, living in very small um, flats um, on very low disposable income, and it makes sense to borrow rather than buy. And also um, civic and enterprise projects, some of which have started off the back of being able to access the tools that we have. So um, a group of residents got together to turn a kind of a waste space at the corner of their road into a beautiful community garden using 500 quid's worth of gardening tools that they paid less than 30 quid for. Um, and many others like that. So, in terms of the social impact, there's, there's stuff around um, individual well-being, being able to um, borrow a dehumidifier to, you know, get rid of damp in your, in your house rather than having to buy one learning to use things for the first time, and we find this especially with younger and, I guess, female members who aren't totally confident about DIY, but can come in and learn from us. Um, projects, so people starting projects, start, people starting companies by borrowing the sound system, the drinks dispensers, and some chairs for a market stall, suddenly you have a, a business. And people meet uh, every week for the first time. They might have lived on the same street as each other for 30 years and never met but they meet in the Library of Things. You can see a few, a few images of who we're talking about. So, one thing to clarify, it's not a second-hand shop. The quality of the items is absolutely part of the experience of being something that's better than buying. And whilst we run a shoestring pilot, we realise very quickly that you might get people interested but they won't borrow unless the stuff is great, unless it's really high quality. So, 
We have a broad range of, of um, products spanning um, cleaning, because that's a steam cleaner, catering, gardening, adventuring, DIY and hobbying, much more than a tool library. And in terms of what's most popular, um, these are a selection of I think about seven of our most popular items. There is a seasonality to this, so this is starting to look different already because it's spring and gardening stuff's being lent out. But the carpet cleaner is the absolute winner. <laughs> it's nine, nine quid to borrow. It's been borrowed 54 times. The drill, unsurprisingly, perhaps it's five pounds for the week. It's the classic item that's held up as being built to be used for 12 minutes in its whole lifespan. Our drills get used every week for many, many hours. Uh, hand sanders, steam cleaners, sewing machines, ukuleles are really popular, with kids especially, um, and jigsaws. And some stats here along the bottom, that's our, um, our software platform that powers the borrowing. Uh, any one time we can have between 20 and 30 items out on loan, um, a, a queue of reservations that's growing every week. And bottom right hand uh, graph there is the number of loans we're enabling per month. So bear in is a really small operation, but it's going up. Um, and we're aiming for um, 15 loans every day that we're open, so quite a lot. Um, this is an interesting proposition um, we heard from uh, about the um, retailers and what's the proposition to companies that sell these items. We are, if we do well, they'll be out of business in a few years, they know that, they're engaged in the sharing economy. So for retailers, our local B&Q sponsors our DIY stuff. For, totally for free, we go on shopping sprees. They, hope, they run our DIY classes because they've got very skilled people that know how to use those items and they run how-to classes for us totally for free. They do that because they see us as their community outreach arm and they're under pressure from head office to be engaged in their community. That's a different proposition to manufacturers who see us as um, buyers of surplus stock or obsolete products. So they bring out the Karcher K4 version 2 pressure washer and all the Karcher K4 version 1s have to go somewhere and it's a cost to them. So we source them and they're perfectly usable. Um, and we're trying to partner with, we've had support so far from Berghaus in Patagonia um, and Hitachi and pitching to Bosch and Karcher and Kenwood as um, our ideal best quality brands for our products. Oh, an interesting, one more interesting thing perhaps is um, they're interested in product insight. So they pay quite a lot of money to test products in-house through focus groups. We have a pool of 500 active borrowers using things every week, um, and we learn an awful lot about which hinge breaks first on the carpet cleaner that they could probably improve on. So we can, we can pass that up and sell it back to them. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail on this. You'll see the numbers. It's, pretty, it's a pretty small operation right now but it does stack up. Um, the intention is for this to be a completely financially self-sufficient business. Uh, in our first year, we make a small loss of a few hundred quid, but very quickly we can start recouping that. This is the direct service. So this is the cost of us getting things in and lending them out. This is excluding overhead. Um, this is okay, the proposition to um, other people setting up their own libraries of things. The, the social impact has to stack up. This is seen as a plug-in that can really bring people together and save environmental resource. But it might be a plug-in that actually helps generate revenue in a, in a, in a kind of underperforming space like a local library. However, in our case, on our, on our own, with one library of things in the network, we carry a disproportionate overhead for what we do. So my, the insurance package that we had to get neatly bespoke uh, it didn't exist, we had, to, we had to take that out ourselves, and it took about a year to get. Um, when you sign up many more libraries of things, the cost per, for each one goes dramatically down. The same with sourcing stock. When we can get these partnerships in place, the overhead, the cost of sourcing the items drops completely. Um, and in our case, um, being... Um, one service plugged into a community sharing hub. We don't pay rent, for example, where we are. Um, that could be improved even more. We might share one employee between the social supermarket, the community garden, the cafe, and us. There's no need for us to pay one person. Um, so for this part of the business model, we're still relying on grants to cover. 
our cost. In terms of the plan, um, it's about getting this one site ticking over financially in the short to mid term. So growing revenue, launching the subscription membership, upgrading the stock in order to pull people in. Pull people in. Um, long term, I'll touch on this very quickly. Um, the objective is obviously to get as many people borrowing as possible. Um, that process is starting, uh, has started a few months ago. Um, in response to daily, like several requests every day from Melbourne, Brazil, like South, everywhere, can you help me set up a library of things? We've not had a systematic way to respond to that yet, but we've launched what's called the Library of Things Bootcamp and the toolkit of how to do it and how to get started. We see those all as nodes in one network, sharing one platform. So your membership to the Dublin Library of Things is, is exchangeable when you come to London for the weekend and you need to borrow the sound system. We're starting an experimental way with that because it, there's a lot to work out. Um, maybe one interesting thing to share because it cropped up earlier is we see this as one cooperative. So one platform owned by all of the libraries of things. And those um, new teams taking it on right now um, look like a housing association in Peterborough, a local high street regeneration project in um, Portobello Road in West London, a community run library in South London, all operating at a similar scale, similar size spaces, but as I mentioned, it could just be one individual that's a member of that platform, or it could be a whole business. This is, um, this is the people setting up their own libraries of things to come, and this is how we see um, library of things stacking up um, in, a, in a whole kind of community-owned sharing hub of services, which might include the repair cafe, the co-working crash for childcare, it might include the community kitchen, the growing spaces, um, all, all as a whole, in which case they suddenly become very viable and very scalable. And this is us. Thank you. Thank you very much.